Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to this to this lecture. And the title of this lecture is "My program was running fast six months ago. What happened?" Or, in the essence, why do programs tend to get slower over time? I'm sure everybody has uh, have, has had uh, uh, a situation when something like this happens. So let's delve, dive into details. Uh, before before we start, a short note about myself. So my name is Ivica Bogosaljevic from Serbia. Uh, I, I do application performance. So my profession, professional focus is how to make your programs run faster. faster. Um, and I mostly focus on C and C++ programs. So we use better algorithms. We, use, we try to exploit hardware better. We use the standard library in a better way. You use programming languages in a better way or the operating system. I also do work as a performance consultant, so when people have problems with debugging performance issues, I help them. And also I help training with teams that, that, that develop performance as the software. So, introduction. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, as software develops and you add more features to it, it's some, some, somehow it feels to get slower, even though uh, in a way, you wouldn't expect that to happen. Now, there are several reasons. So there is not one reason why this happens. There are several of them. And I group, grouped them into five categories, and we'll talk about them in this lecture. The first category is architectural issues. So issues in how your software is designed. Uh, there are algorithmic issues. So these are not these are the issues in how well is your algorithm, how well is your algorithm working. Then there are issues with memory allocations, uh, uh, memory issues with compiler optimizations, and there are also issues with uh, uh, with hardware which prevent your your program from running from full speed at full speed. Okay, so the first topics are, are architectural issues. So when it comes to architectural issues, uh, architectural issues can be in essence divided into divided into API design issues. So architecture generally deals with API design, with internal component design, and how different components work together to achieve a certain goal. So the problem with architectural issues that make your program run slower is that they can require a lot of rewrite to improve. So you need to coordinate several teams and you need to do many changes in many places. So if uh, for performance sensitive systems, you need to, to take uh, you need to take into account the considerations related to architecture if you want to get uh, if you get want to get to do good performance and you have to do it from the beginning you cannot do it later or you can do it but with much higher price but luckily with careful design most of the time you can you can uh, you don't have to hit the wall so the first architectural issue is generally known as static components chatting means just speaking without any need. So as I said, the software consists of logical components or modules. We call them in this lecture components. And the components exchange information among themselves to get some work done. Now, if you're uh, interested into, into making components work as fast as possible, you need to think about a little bit, include performance in the, in the design decisions for your API. Uh, there are two crucial things you should do. One is to the minimize the number of time component A has to communicate with component B. And the second thing is you need to minimize the size of the messages exchanged between A and B. Okay, if you follow this, you should generally achieve a good API design, uh, which is streamlined from performance. However, if components talk a lot, they exchange a lot of messages that they are called chatty. Uh, for example, a typical when you will see chat, chatty components is when you have, you have two components, they communicate somehow, and the one is sending data to the other one by one instead, in, instead of sending data in bulk. Instead of sending one million data, it will send just data one by one, so one piece of data by one. Now, why chattiness kills? Why, why is the reason why, why such design kills performance? So there are several reasons to it. The first is the overhead of function calls. So function calls is a uh, function call just takes some time. If the function in component B, which you're calling is really short, the overhead of function calls can be severe. Uh, that's the, 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 the number one reason. Luckily, compilers are most of the time now good at doing inlining, but cross component inlining is not. So inlining when you have a compilation unit, 
uh, one and compilation unit two. So the functions from compilation two to unit two generally don't get in line with comp uh, compilation unit one. Also, if you are using dynamic libraries, this also doesn't happen. The second reason why chatting check skills performance for cell uh, is that it inhibits compiler optimization. So by inhibiting, if you don't have inlining, the compiler generally cannot optimize well functions uh, which are not inline. It can only optimize inline code, and this can make, in certain certain uh, of, uh, occurrences, it can make your function like running two or three times slower than it actually needs to be. Next, we have the overhead of critical section protection. So if you have a component and it's critical, it has a critical section, so several threads are accessing it, and you are adding mutexes, you need to lock and lock mutexes. If the function shows the overhead of locking and unlocking mutexes will, can, be, can be large. And the last thing is instruction cache misses. So we'll talk about instruction cache misses later. I'm just mentioning if you have chatting components, you'll have those as well. Uh, the price of chattiness, if you're running in a single process, is so so. But if you were, if at one point you need to move components for whatever reason, security often to another process, then the price becomes higher. So this uh, uh, chatting, which crosses the border between processes, is more expensive. And so is if you have two processes that are running on the on, on two two machines. So the, the price of chattiness can be really 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 high. Uh, there are some additional problems. Uh, these, these three or four problems are generally related to chatting, chattiness, and there are additional problems. Uh, if the component is not chatty, that means it's sending data in bulks. And there are several op optimizations, compiler optimizations or comp optimization chattiness that require that you process data in bulk, not just one by one. Only in that case, you can achieve some additional speed up if that is needed. So fixing later is difficult because it requires a large rewrite. Now, the example of chatty components is the example of system allocator, the implementations of malloc and free. So malloc, the function malloc, uh, the second, the function malloc, malloc allocates just one block of memory and function free just releases one block of memory. But many times you have a program that you have data structures that need to allocate one million ident identical objects. So this, uh, in some naive implementations of, of the system allocator, this can require uh, one million calls, function calls, one million, million locks, and one million unlocks, and uh, relatively short work inside it. So the, the overhead of allocation can be really large. So what would the alternative be? Uh, malloc that can allocate variable number of blocks. So this is a malloc which is over loaded and it has the size but also has a count and then re it re returns the chained blocks uh, pointer pointers as blocks and we can also have a free function that can take this chained version chain chained blocks of memory returned by malloc so performance benefits in this case uh, there are several of them first the allocator can organize the memory better if it, it knows it will give out one million blocks so this is one important consideration. If the allocator knows it will be giving one million blocks, then it can allocate from a dedicated memory pool, which has additional good implications for performance. There is decrease in overhead in function call, decrease overhead of multi-threading syn synchronization, and improved instruction caches. So we talk about this a little bit later. OK, questions? Not so far. Okay. Not so far. Okay. Yeah. Not so far. Moving on to the next topic related to architectural uh, issues that can cause performance problems is data copying and data conversions. So, uh, as your, the complexity of your system grows, the, the need for data copying or data con conversion increases. And but the problem with both of them is neither data copying nor data conversion do any useful work. So. Data, the, the essence of computing is processing data, moving from one form or, or, or to another. And data copying and data conversion just change the memory layer, but they don't necessarily modify the data. And uh, with your component design, you should avoid them as much as possible. Um, sometimes data copying it cannot be avoided. I mean, if you have a component which you have a component which has a method called get bucket. You need to get bucket and then you need to write to it 
Uh, so if you want to, to communicate to other component that produces output uh, on its, it produces output in its own buffer and you need to do some kind of data comp copying. Additionally, if you have uh, two components which weren't designed with a similar intention in mind, you will have to have some kind of data conversion if, in order for them to, to talk. And these things can be avoided with clever design. So the data format should be agreed to before either of components is designed. So one of the problems with component design often is that the, the people think about the API, but they don't think about the data their the component is processing. The first thing you should spec try to specify is the data, what it comes in and what comes out of the component. And when you have that in place, the other teams can look this up uh, and you can create a good system. But if you first design the API and you get the data, if you don't get the data right, you get this problem of data copying and data conversion. Also, if you're using external libraries or components, you can use the data format expected by those libraries that you're using. Okay, question about this? No questions yet. Okay, moving on to contention. So what is contention, resource contention? Contention generally means getting stuck in line and waiting for something to happen. So there is a resource contention, contention when you're waiting on a resource. Now this resource can be anything. I mean, for in the computing system can be CPU, memory can be the disk, it can be the network uh, data from the network. In the world of components, contention often happens on waiting to enter the critical section. So this is where these getting stuck happens. So this is where, where the components get stuck. They wait, try to get the, the, into the critical section, but it doesn't work. Now, if you look at one mutex and you look at its utilization percentage, how much of the time is it locked? If the utilization is high, like it's locked 90% or 95% of the time, then the waiting time times tend to explode. They, 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 they uh, grow uh, exponentially. So there is a mathemat mathematical explanation for this called Kingman's formula. And this is how it looks on an example system. It's not, uh, it's not the, um, uh, it's not the, this uh, diagram is from uh, from production, so from work, uh, factory production. So it's not from the development, but the the line looks exactly the same. So what happens when the utilization of your mutex is low, like 20, 30, 40 percent percent, then essentially no component is waiting to enter the critical section. But as as soon as the percent the utilization grows above like 70, 80, 90, 95 percent then the, the waiting time just go, goes mad. So it really jumps uh, over, the, 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 over the roof. Now, uh, the shape of this curve, exact shape of the, this curve depends on several parameters, but this is the, essentially, this is the shape. It can, it, it can start to, to rise up a bit earlier or a bit later, but essentially, this is the shape. Uh, when the, the, the components, when the mutex is 100%, it's, it's locked 100% of the time, the waiting time becomes infinite. So uh, example of contention that you will often see in your system is uh, the logger. So the logger is a component which writes logging data to a file and many components, other components are using the logger to put uh, logging data into files. So the logger works with one file, so it has to have a critical section protected by a mutex. Now, what's the problem with, the, with this design? So when the utilization is large, so many components are waiting to put data in, into the logger, to write data on the disk. And the system, the program, the system becomes much slower and it's getting slower as, 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 uh, the number of components increases, the work that the logger has done, it can really, really become, be, become the bottleneck. And th there is a domino effect here. So uh, components, few components are waiting for the logger to, to complete, and the other components are waiting for this component to complete. Now the whole system is stuck, uh, stuck and basically everything, everything uh, depends on the, 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 the amount of time, the, the speed of the input output, of the input out of the disk. So the, the, the program will work better if you buy a, a faster disk. Now, this effect described by Kingman's formula can be seen everywhere. So uh, DevOps, people who work with the, the development with, with, with servers, 
if the server is overloaded, that means it will stop being responsive. So if you have that the disk usage on a server is 95%, that disk can that server cannot process any more requests. It happens on the database. If the database is a component, your system is more than 90 or 95 percent busy. 90 99 percent of the time busy. That means that it will your system will wake on the database. That happens in the bank. If you go to the bank, if the bank teller is working eight, if his shift is eight hours a day and he's working eight hours, hours a day, that means there is a huge line waiting for him. So he, at no point is he free. Also, you see that in overloaded highway. So in the highway, if there are many traffic, it gets slower and slower, slower. Okay. Questions about contention? Yes, we have one. We have one question from Jonas. He's, ask, he's asking, what's your preferred approach to measure mutex utilization? Uh, what is my preferred? Uh, so I don't do that. Uh, normally, I don't optimize that much in the architectural level. So uh, I, I don't have a clear preference. So okay. there is a, if you if you are if you are trying to investigate contention, if you want to find which mutexes are locked, but it doesn't measure utilization rate of the mutexes. It measures how many times it got locked. So you can see that there is in the perf tool there is a event for that, and you can set up counters with that, uh, and then you can see how that happens. Okay. So the perf is the tool on Linux that I use for that, but it doesn't give you utilization rate of the mutex. It just gives you how many times this mutex got locked. And if you see there are like million uh, locks to the mutex, but nine nine hundred thousand happen on this particular lock, you'll see that lock is like a hot lock. Something is going on here. Okay. Other questions? Thanks. Not so far. Not so far. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're done with architectural issues. Now the problem with that, when I wrote this article, normally I don't do that architecture and this high level architecture anymore. So uh, I guess the people also have some experiences related to architectural patterns that, that create code that is slow. So after the meeting, if you have some time, if you have some experience to share with me, because I have this also as an article and I would like to keep it up to date. Okay, so next, Types of issues are algorithmic issues, and uh, algorithmic issues are issues, especially algorithm uh, algorithm centered. So the algorithmic issues appear because the data set size grows, the the amount of the, the, the data that the system has to process grows. So if you profile an application, and profiling means to determine which fun functions or which loops or which functions take the most time, if you have a small data set. You will see many loops with different complexities in performance profiles. Some loops can have O of n complexity, some can have O on n log n, some can have complexity of O of n squared. But with the large with the large data set, uh, the, 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 the loops with highest data complexity, you will see that the, in the data in the in the in the performance profile only the loop with high data complexity. So in this case, the loops that are previous O of n o, o and O of n log n will disappear completely, and you're left on with only with O n squared. Uh, and this, the most algorithmically most complex loops, uh, eats up all the runtime programs runtime. So uh, what is the general conclusion? Is uh, that programs with complexity that is larger than n log n do not scale well. If you have a, if you have a, uh, if you have a, let's take an example on, on image processing. If your CPU, in, you have an embedded CPU, and your CPU is doing well to, to process image which is, has a dimension 1,000 times 1,000 pixels. Now, if you increase the dimension, uh, the, the size of the image by two, so 2,000 by two times 1,000 uh, pixels, then in that case, the 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 loop has to uh, the, the CPU has to be four times faster. And if you did it three times, then the CPU has to be nine times faster. So at one point, the, the, the software stops scaling. If, you're, if your program has a hot loop, which, which has a n log n, higher than n log n, it will stop scaling. Um, yes, uh, okay, that's all about algorithm, al algorithmic issues. So if you have an ON2 loop and a large data set, either you need to find a way to decrease the complexity of the algorithm, or you need to move to some high, high, high performance computing or with uh, GPU com computing that can handle this, this kind of stuff. Questions?
No, Hello. no, no questions. Okay. No questions so far. So I think most people were experienced about the, the algorithmic and uh, had some sense, had some natural understanding of the algorithmic issues and the architectural issues. Now we're going a bit deeper. Now we're talking about memory allocation. So what about memory allocation? System allocator in your program is a shared resource. So it's a shared component. So implementations of malloc free, new and delete, go through the system allocator. And imagine you add to your program a new component that uses the system allocator a lot. So you have a new component that allocates many blocks of memory. So what happens? The data fragmentation rate, memory fragmentation rate for the data increases for the old components, not only the new code, for everyone. And uh, increased uh, data fragmentation, memory fragmentation means lower performance. Also, the data cache hit rate also decreases. So data cache hit rate is really important. We talk about that a bit later, but having a high data cache hit rate means that you have good performance. And as a result, all components that rely on heavily on the system allocator get slower. So this doesn't happen if you're processing your, if your component is processing data in an array, this, you don't have problems with memory allocation. But if you have a component that uses binary trees, linked list based data structures, some hash maps, all types of pointers, it will generally create a lot of cost to the system allocator and actually has a tendency to, to slow down slow down the performance in other components of your system. So there are a few mit mitigation strategies. So the system allocator, the implementation of malloc in free is not something, there are several other implementations which are not from the glibc on Linux. So there is the, Google has one implementation of the system allocator, Microsoft has another, Facebook has a third one, all of them are in open source. And typically they are much faster than the building allocator because they do some, some stuff differently. So one way is to use a different system allocator. And often the programs that are, that are memory bound, that have problems with memory, the memory is a bottleneck really benefit from changing the system allocator. You can get like 10 or 15% increase in speed. The second mitigation strategy is to have per component allocator. So each component allocates its memory from a dedicated block. So if th there is no mixing of memory between different components. Now, this is also a good approach. It increases memory consumption a, a, a bit, but uh, generally uh, with this approach, you would get the benefit of good, uh, you won't have problems with memory fragmentation. You won't have problems with the increase in data cache miss rate. So everything should work faster. Okay, questions? No, we don't have questions so far. Okay. Next thing that can slow down your program is uh, our compiler optimizations. Now, how do compilers optimization, what's the problem there? So the problem is that compiler optimizations are fragile. So the, to, to do optimize your code to some perfect form, the compilers rely on pattern matching and heuristics. So, and these things break. So pattern matching means sometimes if the pattern is not recognized, then the compiler needs to emit inefficient code. If some heuristics finds that the certain optimization is not worth the effort, it can de-optimize that code and make it slower. So the two classical examples of, of, of uh, compiler optimization that can break the performance of your code is vectorization and inlining. So first about the inlining. Function inlining meaning instead of having a function call, you take the function body and copy it instead of the call. Now inlining itself is not that important by itself, but with inlining, this opens the door for many compiler optimizations. Without the inlining, just function calls are really zero optimization possible for the compiler. And in some, if at some point the, the compiler decides not to inline a certain function, you can see a, a sharp decrease in performance. Inlining is one thing. The second thing is vectorization. So a vectorization is another compiler optimization technique. It relies on vector, vector instructions in the CPU. CPU has some special vector instruction that can process more than one piece of data uh, in a single instruction. For example, it can process four integers or four doubles. Now, for the compiler to emit vector instruction in this process called vectorization, there are certain, uh, certain preconditions that needs to be met. 
And sometimes you can add just one bad line and it can break vectorization. And when that happens, it happens, you see a sharp decrease in performance. A code that is well optimized might get easily de optimized, which you can add just one additional line and the loop, hot loop in your code can get de vectorized or one additional line in your function and that function becomes too large and stop, stops being inlined. So also sometimes when you change the compiler, so you're going from, for example, for example, from GCC to Clang, or you upgrade the compiler version from GCC 7 to GCC 11, sometimes this also breaks optimizations. Now, unfortunately, there is no generic solution to that, but uh, most of the time writing C pretty easy to maintain code helps because the compilers are generally well adapted for uh, analyzing that, that kind of code. Okay, questions? No. No, we don't have questions so far. Okay. Uh, I hope it's because uh, the topic is interesting and not boring. Okay, <laughs> no, moving, sure. on to, sure. moving on to hardware issues. Now, hardware issues, so they're not issues in hardware because they're issues in software, but they happen because the software grows. So what happens is if when your program becomes larger or your data set becomes larger, somehow it becomes less hardware friendly. So what happens? There are three, three things that happen, three, let's say, big things that happen. Larger program means more instruction cache misses. We talk about that a bit later. Larger data sets means more data cache misses. We talk about it a bit later also. And this is a failure to use the CPU's vectorization unit. This is closely correlated to what I was saying in the previous slide. So if the compiler doesn't emit vector instructions, it emits standard scalar, slow scalar instructions, the CPU vectorization units are idle and this code will run slower and you can write like two or three or four times slower. It's not like 10% slower. So when you add new statements to your loops, it get, they get more complicated, compiler has problems uh, recognizing uh, the compiler has problem uh, doing the, 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 the optimization and this code read ends being slower. Okay, now question, uh, next topic is if you have more code, that means you have more instruction cache misses. Now what, are, what is an instruction cache? Instruction cache is a special memory inside the CPU. So memory and CPU are separate. CPU is one chip, memory is another chip, and there is a bus connecting them. Now, inside the CPU, there is another memory called instruction cache. This memory is really small, like 32 kilobytes or 64 kilobytes. And this memory is used to speed up access to instructions. So instructions are stored in the main memory and instruction cache can speed up access to those instructions. So how does instruction cache works? If the instructions you're trying to execute is already instruction cache, you can get fast access. But if instruction is not the, in the instruction cache, that means it needs to be fetched from the main memory. And this is slow access. You need to wait for the instruction. The CPU cannot execute the instruction, it needs to wait. If the instruction has not been used by the CPU for a long time, it will get removed from the cache. It, it goes out. So the, the, the instruction cache is 32, let's say that the instruction cache is 32 kilobytes in size, and your program is 16 kilobytes, a small program. So what happens? It fits completely the instruction cache. So if it's, it's running long enough time, the whole program is in the instruction cache, and that means that that means that there is no delays in the coding instructions. But when your program becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, then your instruction cache doesn't hold the whole program. It just holds some parts of the program that are currently being executed. And the instruction caches, uh, instruction cache misses start to appear. The bigger the program, the, you will you will expect more instruction cache misses. So some programs suffer more from this issue. So if your program is moving quickly from one function to another function to another function, so if you have a loop that goes through several functions and goes back, these programs will typically experience more instruction cache misses. If you have like a small loop where everything happens inside a block of kind of instructions, you don't have problems with instruction cache misses. So are there any ways to, ways to mitigate these problems? So there are. Uh, there are three ways generally. So the first one is called Bolt. Bolt is a special tool. I think it's developed by Facebook. So what does it do? 
you run your program and this uh, with a profiler and profiler uh, collects information about which function called which function how much time did each function execute so it tries to create like a call graph and it tries to create uh, to establish which functions are hot and which are not so both take this information as an input and then changes the placement of functions inside your binary so it puts those functions that's call one another close to one another in memory and this thing decreases the data cache my, misses so facebook people claim that this gives them like 10 percent performance on their servers next thing is a profile profile guided optimization so profile guided optimization is another compiler technique and this technique is used to um uh, it works similarly as bold so you first you collect data about functions call graphs and so on but and then you feed this information to the profile uh, to the compiler now the compiler with this information compiler can also optimize the memory layout of functions of functions in order to avoid instruction cache misses but it can also apply aggressive optimizations to hot code and leave most of the a cold code that is not executed often it can leave them to be short and to be short but unoptimized because it doesn't influence program performance almost at all so that's another way to do it the third one is called the link time optimization they also decrease instruction cache decrease instruction cache miss rate and how they do it they allow link time optimization allow the compiler to inline functions from another c file if you have two c files Generally, they're individual compilation units, but with link time optimization, you can inline the function from file A into the into the function in file B. Okay, questions? No, no questions. Okay. Checking now. No. Okay. Next thing is uh, why do programs get slower, which is a hardware issue, is that with larger workloads, with larger data sets, there are more data cache misses. So what is a data cache? A data cache is a small memory on the CPU, very similar to instruction cache, that it uses to, to speed up access to commonly used data. So instruction cache speed up, speeds up access to instructions, data cache speeds up access to data. If the data is in the data cache, piece of data is in the data cache, you get a fast access. If it's not, then you need to get data from the main memory, the access is slow. So there is a problem with random access data structures. So these are trees, cache maps, linked lists, but not arrays. Arrays, a vector are not random access. They can be random access if you're accessing randomly. But if you go from left to right, or left to right to left, you're not accessing them randomly. So there is a pattern. And the CPU can take advantage of this. So the problem with the random access data structures, trees, cache maps, linked lists. So how does it look like in the graph? How does it look like in the graph? Larger workload means more data caches misses. So we, we did a measurement uh, to see the difference. So lookup in, in a small data structure is faster than lookup in a large data uh, large one. And we measured the time needed to do 8 million searches inside a hash map. OK, now we do 8 million searches. So we would expect that the runtime of the program doesn't depend on the hash map size. It doesn't matter if the hash map has 64 entries or 1 million entries or 4 million entries. But if you look at this graph here, you see that the runtime is about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 for 64 entries. And then for 260k entries, it goes higher to six, 600 milliseconds. And with 16 million entries, it goes higher to one second. And with 64 million entries, it goes even higher. You see that the, even though we're doing 8 million searches, the runtime depends on the hash map size. Uh, so why this, does this happen? This happens because, again, the, 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 the hash map, the data from the hash map doesn't fit the data cache. So there is no reuse of data. You access data for the large data hash map. You access data once, and then it gets evicted from the cache because some other data is needed. And when you're accessing the same data again, it's not in the data cache, so the performance suffer there. So are there any solutions or strategies to work around this? So there are no general solutions. You, always you will have the, the, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, function, this, this numbers will always look something like that. 
But there is also ways to do is that you can get these numbers to be smaller. So instead of having 1.5 seconds with this hash map from the STL, that you can get 0.7 with another hash map that is more data cache friendly. So what are the mitigations? Uh, if you're using hash maps, there are open addressing hash open addressing hash maps that are more data cache friendly. Although they're not, they also have their own problems. So they're not like uh, out of the box replacement solution. It doesn't work like that. You need to test them. Next, you have instead of binary trees, you have binary trees. So a tree where inside a single node you don't have pointers to two, but you can have pointers to three or four or five. So and inside a single node of the tree you hold two or three or four values. So this generally makes the increases data cache hit rate. And also you can use binary trees with uh, good memory layout. So there are several mem memory layouts and, then, and I wrote about them in my blog. So I didn't write them, it, it has the name of some scientists, but I did write down, I can look it up later if you need it. But if you optimize for memory layout, you can generally get better numbers for the same data structure size. Okay, questions about uh, data cache misses and data set size. Yes, we have two questions. Okay, one is, the first is, does a vector slow down as much as a hash map with increasing size? I imagine it might be faster due to less fragmented data. Uh, is, yeah, so yes, you're on the right track. The, 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 the person asking questions is on the right track. So all these talks about data cache misses apply to hash sets. So for vector, if you are going on a vector and you're going from zero to N, and it doesn't matter if vector is one megabyte or, or 100 megabytes, the time you need to go through that vector depends on the vector size. So it doesn't, it's not slower because you, the, large, the data structure is larger. Okay. Second one is from Sasha. Uh, well, okay, at the end of the, actually this is uh, at the end of the talk, we have a note. Uh, so if you want to take this at the end, uh, Sasha recommends okay. to, to take it at the end. Sorry, I, I, I haven't read it before. So maybe we okay. can take it to the end. Maybe we can take okay. it to the end. Okay, so we're almost at the end. So, um, so we're almost there. So this is the last slide. So the last problem is with the problem of processing large classes. So you have structures of classes, doesn't matter that they're large, you have many data members. The larger the class, that means more data cache misses. Now, why does that happen? So this, this problem is not related to the random access data structure. This is a problem that happens with larger classes. If you keep them in array, you'll have problems. The bigger the data, the class size, the slower the processing. So what happens is that the data fetched from the memory to the cache, instruction uh, data cache is, ca uh, is fetched in blocks. You, do, you don't go to the memory just to pick one byte. You go there and you pick a block of 64 bytes. And this whole block is fetched to the, to the data cache. So what you have, if you have a large data class, if you have a large class, but you're accessing only two or three data, two or three members, if you have a like class with 10 members, you're accessing only two or three, you're bringing in from the main memory to the data cache, the data that the CPU is not using. And the memory bottleneck is, in most systems, the memory bottleneck is in the memory, not in the CPU. And when you do this, when, the, when you bring, this, uh, bring these large, large classes to the, to the uh, data cache, um, this increases data cache miss rate and directly in, uh, decreases performance. So here's an example that we measured. How much time do we need to process 20, millions, 20 million elements of an array? So this is some, some function called calculate surface, and this is its runtime. So we created a test class, which has variable size, and the size of the class goes from 20 bytes to 504 bytes. And we're doing the same kind of processing. The function doesn't change anything inside. We are just adding some padding data there. Padding data means that the, means that the, this padding is unused, but it will be brought from the memory to the data cache. So these are the padding bytes are actually the, the members of the class that you're not using in your hot function. So what happens? Runtime in the class is smallest, 20, 20 bytes is best. 
it's about 20 milliseconds or 30 milliseconds and now it starts to grow and at one point it grows to 130 milliseconds so the difference between the class size of 20 bytes and class size of 184 bytes is a substantial it's like four or five times slower so you see a large slowdown as 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 the the the, the system is the class size is bigger or to put it another way it's not that the class size is bigger it's that you're not using the all the members of the class if you're using all the members of the class then you have them you don't have any problems so what are the mitigations to this problem so mitigations is one of the way to work around it is to decompose large classes into smaller classes so this is a general approach if you have a hot function and it's processing classes and the classes are large if you remove unused member you'll get speed improvement we guaranteed so the second way to do it is called entity component system and it's just going additional it's decomposing large classes into smaller places in a different way so this is a paradigm like object oriented paradigm this is another paradigm and it is used is used in c++ so plus plus supports this paradigm and it's used by game developers because they are after speed they want the games to run fast they don't want to bring unused data from the memory to the data cache because this directly influences the performance of the game so entity component system is about different way to think about problems and different way how to decompose problems into classes but as a result, you'll get smaller classes and this will have positive impact on performance. That's it. We are at the end. Questions? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thanks, Ivich, for, for the session. We have a lo lots of questions so far. So, okay, first of all, since we are at the end, we can take finally Sasha's questions about uh, any recommendation book, uh, website, or other resources. Uh, for digging into the optimization topic and also tools. So, so I do, I write a lot about, uh, I have a lot of, a lot of, uh, I, myself, I write a lot about performance. So this is the site, Johnny Software Lab. And they're like, I think now there are about 20 or 25 posts that are specifically talking about all sorts of optimizations, C++, uh, uh, low level optimization, high level optimizations, compiler operating system, and so on. So there is a lot of interesting material there. Uh, there is also one free book by Dennis Bakhvalov. You can download it from his site, or you can uh, you can uh, you can um, download it from his site, or you can buy it on Amazon. The book is free, but if you buy it, you get to keep the copy, and it helps the author. So that's the, se the second book. This book is most about, it's called Performance Analysis and Tuning on Modern CPUs. And it's mostly about low level optimization, how to better use the hardware. And there is also a third book, it's called High Performance C++. Mm -hmm. So this book is by Vic Ferzer and Bjorn Andris. So High Performance, C++ High Performance, and it's a really good book. So I have these two books in my, in my, in my library that I use for, for, for nice. my work. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the recommendation. Um, okay, we have other questions. One is from Jacob. What's the difference between allocating a continuous uh, array of one million objects and the alternative malloc you presented? Mm, so I don't understand what he means. What is the difference between uh, if you're allocating a, a vector of one million elements, you get one block of memory, and that's completely fine. It's not a big problem. But if you're allocating a binary tree with one million objects, then you get one million calls to the one million calls to the system allocator, and that is the problem. That decreases data fragmentation. That decreases data cache, the data cache, uh, data cache uh, hit rate. And there is a lot of space to improve on this. So if you're good with memory layout, I talk about that in my blog. If you're good with memory layout, you can get very decent speed improvement. Okay. Okay. Uh, another one is from Matthias. Does memory alignment play a large role? Uh, it used to play, but not anymore. So it used to play, uh, memory alignment used to play a, a large role in speed performance, but not with, with modern CPUs. So with modern CPUs, generally, you, you, I've, you cannot get, like, you can get maybe with proper memory alignment 
10 or 20 percent speed improvement but you cannot get like two or three times so there is some speed improvement if the data if you're using aligned instructions then you get a guarantee if you're using unaligned instructions on intel cpus then then uh, if the data is itself aligned but the instructions are unaligned they work exactly the same as the aligned instructions if the data if the data is not aligned then you get some performance under some conditions you can get like performance glitches but nothing nothing spectacular okay okay another one from jacob is uh, is stack data generally more often in the cache than heap because surrounding variables are often accessed as well yes so stack stack data and allocating the stack it's faster uh, for several reasons so one of the things why stack is faster is because the allocation on stack is just increasing one counter so it's one instruction whereas in the allocate in the dynamic memory you have to go and look for the block of appropriate size and then bring it back so that's one thing and the second thing is the stack is always used the top of the stack is always in the data cache because these variables are used often and they're keep they're reused often the same data is reused you leave the function you enter the another function and this is belongs to the same piece of memory so this memory is almost always in cache okay okay then we have another one it's uh, regarding memory optimizations what are your yeah. thoughts regarding optimizing data structure layout for better caching for example yeah. putting hot data first minimizing padding etc cetera, etc cetera. So yeah, yeah, these things are actually used a lot in those industries where when there is a performance performance is really important, like games or like high frequency trading or, or or maybe some data processing also, they they manipulate the memory layout in order to get better performance because manipulating memory layout actually increases data cache hit rate with binary trees, with with, with hash maps, with linked lists everywhere. And it can have a dramatic, it's not a small, sometimes it, the increase can be dramatic. Okay, okay. Then we have other two. Um, okay, this is the most upvoted is, in your experience with your clients, which of the mentioned optimization areas seem to be the most relevant? So it really depends on the software. It depends on the software. Basically, we have software, you, you can divide software into two, into two, into two groups one is the cpu bound software where the bottleneck is inside the cpu and the other one is the memory bottleneck software where the problem is in the memory so the the bandwidth between cpu and memory is not large enough the memory is not fast enough it doesn't respond fast enough now in general object oriented paradigm you most of the time get the memory limited software you don't do a lot of computation but you do a lot of fetching data from memory, fetching classes from memory. On the other hand, scientific computing, image processing, video processing, audio processing, they all work on the data which is in vectors or arrays, and they use simple data types. And this kind of processing is mostly, the, the bottleneck, bottleneck is mostly in the CPU. Okay, okay, then we have one last, I think it's not really a question, it's mostly an observation, and probably requires your comment about this is, David uh, says, I know with CUDA programming, we group threads into blocks to act on uh, a block of memory. It seems like we could use the same model with the CPU and arrange our data in vector blocks that match the size of the CPU data cache. And then our code would act on one block at a time. Yes. So what you're saying basically is exactly the, the all those CPUs and GPUs are different things the the memory layout optimization that work on cpu also work on gpu on gpus the same the same patterns vector are, are, are storing data in arrays or vectors and accessing each element of the array is better that that's true also for gpus and for cpus i don't know so i'm I, i'm not an expert in gpus i just have some knowledge i don't know about the random access data structure is it faster there or not but on cpus memory memory all these attempts to to use the reuse the data from the data cache actually help the software performance okay nice uh we don't we don't have any other questions so far uh we still have a few minutes so folks if you have any other questions for image please 
use the Q&A tab. In the meantime, we have a comment in the chat. Great talk, now my brain is full. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, also David saying thanks and uh, all the other people. I, I think you'll be available in, in the lunch, don't you? Uh, yeah, I'll be available in the next, if, if anybody comes in the next 10 minutes, I'll be there. But if nobody comes, then I'll leave in 10 minutes, OK? OK, so OK. Okay, thank you very okay. much. Hey, thanks, thanks, Ivic, and uh, see you around. Thanks a lot for also for attending. Bye. Peace. Bye.